know, one of the things I've been reading as well that I find sort of fascinating is that as we see emerging information about <coughs> phytochemicals in the foods we eat, mm -hmm. um, we test for all of the things that really matter for the plant's growth, but of course they do a lot of uptake of micronutrients along the way. Right. We're, you know, our soils are deficient in certain micronutrients. I mean, kids that grow up on iodine-poor soils get goiter, that kind of thing, if it's not supplemented. How do you handle the overall picture of soil as a living entity and keeping all those micronutrients and micronutrients in balance? Well, there, there are a number of ways. Um, anytime you save organic matter, and, and I look at it this way, when I buy strawberries and lettuce and carrots and all these things that come from whatever, even mangoes and pineapples that come from all over the world, each of these have some micronutrients in them. So if you are composting those as opposed to throwing, in, throwing them in the garbage and sending them to the landfill, those micronutrients are going to build up. You can add micronutrients too. You can buy molybdenum and manganese and things of that sort uh, if you want to do that. But uh, compost, manures, um, they have to come from somewhere. So it, you're going to have to bring it in. Um, in our area, the nice thing about it is most of our soils are not deficient in micronutrients as much as other parts of the country. You get down the southeast, for instance, they're a little bit more deficient in some of the, some of the things than we are. Uh, but the only way you'll know is to run a test for those particular problems but, or nutrients. For the most part, we don't see uh, recommendations for those things unless you're a commercial grower and you're growing multiple crops like broccoli and cauliflower and things that take say boron out of the soil and they're going to need to add it back but even even so when you buy broccoli you're not eating the leaves or when you grow broccoli you're only eating a small part of that so you're taking just a very small amount off and as long as you're bringing things back in you should be okay with micronutrients if somebody is um, feeding their animals micronutrients which they do supplement they don't use all those micronutrients and some of them come out in the, the waste material. So when you bring manure in and you mix it in with your compost or put it in your garden, then some of those nutrients come back into the system. Is the advice then similar that you should eat a very diet to make sure that you're getting a wide spectrum of things and not too much of something that might be bad? Is that Does that work also for soil? Actually, I would think that it would. Um, I found this nutrition site and um, they give you very detailed information on all the different amino acids that various vegetables will have, the nutrient levels, calorie levels, whether they're inflammatory or not. It's really a, a neat site. And um, one of the things you have to remember is whatever you're wasting goes right back into the soil system. It, it's not destroyed. So if, if there's manganese or zinc or whatever, copper in those materials, they'll get back into the soil. So. Um, yeah, you. I always look at soil as being like a, a bank account. You make withdrawals, you make deposits, and preferably you want to make more deposits than withdrawals. Now when a person is doing soil testing, I know the protocol to do it, but how often does it make sense and are there even more detailed profiles of your soil that you could get if you wanted to, to see about any micronutrients in the soil? Mine's got so little organic matter, I suspect it doesn't have anything. But Well, um, in terms of how often you should do it, about once every three years. You can test for boron and molybdenum and some of the other nutrients, copper, if you want to. Those are extra tests that you can ask the university to run. In some cases, it might be more important than others. Like I mentioned, broccoli and boron is, a, a, is a, an example. Or um, I'm thinking about manganese deficiencies in maple are usually more of a problem because of pH than it is manganese not being in the soil. But for a home, a general home garden, uh, you're probably going to be okay. We're not as intensive on our, on our soil as uh, a lot of commercial growers are. People now are doing more composting. They can add organic matter back to the soil where a farmer is not going to dump a bunch of compost on their, their property simply because when you're dealing with hundreds of acres, you'd have to have massive amounts. So a homeowner can make a big difference if they're, if they're composting. Now, you can also um, check, for instance, if you start a soil building program and <clears throat> you may want to run a, a test where you look at what your organic matter level is in 2008 or whatever and for something like that you probably only need to test every five years if you were interested in finding out how much of a difference you're going to make 
because you you don't change that that quickly. What about the bad stuff that can get in? I have a neighbor, for example, who's doing inject injected sewage waste on the farmland, you know, mm -hmm. putting it into the fields. And there have been some concerns about heavy metals, cadmium, and so forth that can come in, and viruses that can come in with some of the sewage that comes in when it's used in farmland. Does If I have a place next door, do I have to worry about it leaching in? Should I test for some of these things? If I live next to a power plant and there's fly ash coming off or high rates of sulfur, are there things like that I should test for? Well, no, anything that's in the atmosphere is eventually going to settle out onto the soil because of rain. Um, there's no way we can get around that. But I don't think that um, I would panic about those sorts of things. Um, I get a little bit more concerned about somebody that decides that they want to dig up a little garden next to the house and it's an old house and they've used lead paint on it for many, many years. And when they scrape the paint off, guess where it goes? Into the soil. So that lead is still there. I'd, but even, even with lead in the soil, uh, I'm more concerned about lead being on a carrot or a beet or a root crop by just physical uh, contact as opposed to lead being taken up by the plant and deposited in a tomato. That's not likely to happen. So um, that I'm a little bit more concerned about than something that's coming out of the atmosphere because we can't control that. We just, there's nothing we can do. Um, and it's beyond me to tell you what all the materials are coming out of power plants, but if it's a new power plant, they do have requirements that scrub a lot of that stuff out. As far as um, a, a farmer next door that's depositing sewage waste or what's left over from that type of thing on their property, if the land is flat, you don't have to worry about things leaching sideways. If I was on a slope, I'd be a little bit more concerned because things can wash down onto your property, drain down onto the property. But they shouldn't be growing food crops on that land, so... Um, I think they can grow field crops, well, that's but they can't grow food crops for a while. It has to be a certain period of time between when it was last applied and when they can do that. Now, as far as how long bacteria and viruses and all those things last in the soil, you'll have to talk to people uh, that know more about that. But for the most part, viruses don't last long periods of time in the soil. But I can't tell you how long. Well, I was surprised years ago when after the PBB poisoning in Michigan of the animals that years later there mm -hmm. were still tests done that showed uptake of PBB in carrots, which made no sense to me. But it, I mean, I guess anything that gets into the environment will eventually find its was way. Was it to actually the uptake of that well, or was it they found that it, it was it, on them because the PBBs were in the soil? That's what I don't know. See, plants pick up very simple uh, materials. For instance, it'll pick up um, nutrients in ion form and it's my understanding they do not pick up very complex chemicals uh -huh. they they might pick up um, parts of them when they break down into simpler compounds but it's more likely that any contamination came from association with the stuff physically in the soil so when you pull up a carrot for instance there's going to be some soil on it and and even when you clean a carrot you might find little areas there's maybe some soil still on there and that's why a lot of people take a knife and just you know take the outer portion totally off uh, but I'd, I'd be surprised if they could actually pick up those materials and deposit them in the, the taproot so it was just contact it's more likely to be contact but again I'd, I'd defer to an expert on something like that now this kind of service is available nationwide in any state through agricultural extension mm -hmm. to be able to go in and do this kind of soil testing um, if I'm a sustainable farmer in the southeast, my issues are going to be very different than yeah, they are they're going to be the different. West. Yeah, and um, mm -hmm. our, the best bet is to go back every three years at least. And About every three years is what we recommend. And when you consider, in our county, we only charge twelve dollars for a soil test. Uh, that's a pretty good deal. And one of the reasons I tell people they should test their soil is, and I'll use the uh, fertilizer prices as an example. Last year, I could go to the local elevator and buy a bag of urea. For, which is almost all nitrogen, for less than $10. That same bag will cost you almost $18 now. So it makes economic sense to just go down and run the soil test and put only what you need on. Whether you're using organic or conventional, it doesn't really matter because organic fertilizers tend to be more expensive anyway. So why put on more than you really need? I think the dumbest thing that people do when they get into gardening is they tend to, whenever they see a bug, um, 
they go into the garage and look for their insecticides and they don't really know what they're spraying or why they're spraying it. Uh, they may use products that have been in the garage for years and may not even be on the market anymore. I had one lady, this was a number of years ago, that she called and uh, she'd grown some tomatoes and she'd found some chlordane in the garage. And for those people who don't remember chlordane, it was a chlorinated hydrocarbon that uh, was used to control ants and termites and you could make one application and it would still be working 20 years later. Well, she called and asked uh, how long did she have to wait before she could eat her tomatoes. And I basically told her forever because chlordane was never labeled for that use and the stuff doesn't break down. So she basically contaminated her food for good. And that was it. She was done. And I just hope I never buy her land. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the other well, big issue, isn't it? And, yeah. and that's why we have these uh, pesticide collection programs now to get a lot of this stuff out of people's garages. And we're still finding some pretty old stuff.